Hey, good morning, Effort of Community Church. It's great to have you joining us. Whether live right now or picking up later this week, really excited. People are starting to make their way in. In just a few moments, we're going to kick off our service with some worship. Uh, joined here this morning, Jim, we have a really exciting service planned. Uh, I think it's what can great. we expect today? Well, first of all, we're still in our God's Is series. And if you've been following us for the last number of weeks, different ones of our front of house ministers have been sharing out of something that meant so much to them where God showed up. In other words, we can all talk about God's nature and character, sure. which we should, you know, yeah. his faithfulness, his eternalness, his long suffering and all of that. But I have just absolutely loved you sharing on God as good father, mm -hmm. Kevin on provision, Dan on being seen, and you're going to have Wes today, yeah. particularly on God as healer. And man, I just, I know Wes, I know a bit about his story. It's so wonderful to have him ministering to us out of it. Yeah, yeah. specifically healing. Of course, God can heal anything, whether physical, emotional, yeah. mental, but he's focusing and highlighting the emotional side of healing, specifically around church hurts today. Um, and I've heard it, you know, a couple times now, and it's powerful the way people are. I just talked to a guy after the first service, just the way God is meeting people in this message is so powerful. So I would encourage you right now, as we're about to go into our service, just posture yourself before the Lord and really say, like, God, if there's if there's an area of healing that I need, I invite you to come and bring that That's to right. me today. That's the posture we're all gonna take this morning. We also have a really exciting component of our service today that has to do with family news. What is that, Jim? Yeah, man, new members weekend. We have, I think, 30 people. Am I making up that number? Nope, that's Total. Right. Um, man, I'm not sure if you get a chance. Um, I, if not, we're gonna see if this is online for our online community. Right. But we publish a little booklet with a little story about each of these people who will be standing today and us welcoming them in. Yeah. We just wanna make sure that you feel welcome to as we welcome them, we want you to know as the online community, we think and pray about you. Even today, I ran into a woman, been watching us since COVID online, but she's been attending in person the last three weeks, four yeah. weeks, I believe. And yeah. um, just so wonderful. And we encourage you to, if you show up, say hi, because she did. Yeah. yeah. So thank you again for being part of this service. Uh, our vision here is to connect you with God and with others. And an important way we go about doing that is through our Connect card. We actually have an online Connect card. Would you please let us know that you're with us today, how you've been, uh, if there's any way we could be praying for you and how God is going to meet you. If you have a testimony, please let us know that. We have a few other announcements. We're going to send you that way right now. Thanks for being with us. Enjoy the service. Our time together is about to begin, so please make your way into the auditorium. If it's your first time here, you can visit one of our welcome centers where you'll receive a gift and find other helpful resources. We would like to hear from each of you every time you're here. So please fill out a connect card, either in person or online via the ECC app. Let us know how we can pray for you, provide you with care, or join you in celebration. There are multiple opportunities for you to support the ministry of ECC, including giving. You can do this online via our website, through the ECC app, by texting your donation amount to 84321, or by dropping a giving envelope into one of the designated boxes in the auditorium doorways. Stay up to date with all the exciting events happening at ECC throughout the year by signing up to receive our weekly e-news, which is sent out every Thursday. Simply check the appropriate box on your Connect card or subscribe through our website, effortacommunity.church. We believe that the journey with Jesus is taken in steps and encourage you to find your best next step in walking with Him. If you're new to the community, visit the First Steps Room, which is located on the right-hand side of the auditorium's lower level. One of our pastors will be there to help you discover more about who we are as a church. The Next Steps Room is located in the lower lobby directly outside the auditorium. We have people from different ministries there every week. So stop by to learn about the discipleship opportunities we offer and the various ways in which you can get more involved in our community. We invite you to join us now in lifting up the name of Jesus, hearing wisdom from God's Word, and receiving from His Spirit what He knows you need today.
Stanford at Community Church. We're so glad you're here with us. In Psalm 150, it says, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Do you have breath in your lungs this morning? Is anybody alive? Do you guys have breath in your lungs this morning? All right, we're going to praise the Lord together. So join with us as we just worship him. Praise in the valley, praise on the mountain. I praise when I'm sure, praise when I'm doubting. I praise when outnumbered, praise when surrounded. Cause praise is the water, my enemies drown.
it's already been done you can't add to blood it was once for all the father gave his son
in this moment recognize that you're right here with us we can't even begin to fathom and understand the holiness of who you are we just pause and we say we're here for you Father would you come and have your way among your people this morning
sacrifice with one sacrifice he has made perfect forever those who are being made holy the holy spirit testifies to us about this for he says this is the covenant i will make with them after that time says the lord i will put my laws on their hearts and i will write them on their minds then he adds this their sins and lawless acts i will remember no more and where these have been forgiven, sacrifice for sin is no longer necessary. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, all hail King Jesus. Amen. Amen. You can go ahead and be seated. It's good to see each and every one of you. Can I invite you to say hi to your neighbor uh, this morning as we've gathered here? Just hi, that's enough. Just hello. Um, <laughs> we like the fact that we like each other. Um, hey, let me turn my attention now to those of you who might be visiting Ephraim Community Church this morning uh, with us for the first time, or this is um, your, your newer here. Uh, we welcome you. We're glad that you decided to come and worship with us this morning, uh, and also welcome those who are watching with us online. We've been praying that this morning, even through the worship and the preaching of the word, you would experience the presence and the power of the Lord. If you are in the room visiting with us, I'll draw your attention to our Connect cards. They're in the seat back pocket in front of you. For online viewers, you can find that as well. Just click the, click the link right below the screen. You can see a, a connect card link. And that's one way to let us know that you're joining with us. Uh, if you are visiting, feel free to grab a connect card, put your name on it, and hold on to it till the service comes to a close. Uh, Pastor Dan will be over there to my left where it says first steps. Those doors are open and we welcome you to join us over there as the service comes to a close. We'd just like to greet you uh, and welcome you in person. For everyone who's not uh, new here, fill out that connect card. Let us know that you're here. Any way we can pray for you and then drop those in the receptacles as the service comes to a close later on this morning. Hey, you guys ready for a little bit of family news? Yeah. Yes, you guys are awake. This is fantastic. Hey, can we say a big congratulations to Betsy Klein and Nick Van Lohr who were married recently? Absolutely. And can we also say congratulations to Brian Lore and Debbie Myers, who were married February 4th. Hey, I can see that you guys are all warmed up with celebration, so we're going to roll right on into New Members Weekend. This weekend, we're celebrating with 30 people who've decided to identify Ephraim Community Church as their home church. So in just a minute, I'm going to read their names, and I'm going to invite them to stand and stay standing, and we want to pray for them and bless them uh, as they have decided ECC is my home congregation. You know, if you've been around for any period of time, you've probably heard Pastor Kevin talk 
talk about how we love the, the regional body of Christ. Like we love it in all of its forms and all of its expressions. And it's true. Not only do we love the regional expression of the body of Christ, but we pray for it regularly. But there is something to defining that relationship to like, where's my home? And, and what's my home church look like? You know, I have an older brother and a younger brother, and we are all married and have our own families. Um, so it would be weird if my brother's family was like sleeping at my house, like regularly. It's like, you have a home that's over there. Like, I love it when you visit. I love it more when you come and bring tools and help me fix something I don't know how to fix. But like, there's a distinction that different family units have. So while we love the full body of Christ and all of its expressions, we also recognize that there are individual houses of worship and prayer, individual churches, and to identify as like a, that's where the Lord's placed me in this season of my life. And third, like I said earlier, 30 people have decided to make that uh, distinction here this weekend. They went through Connections Pathway, which happens on Saturday morning monthly, learned a little bit about the church and said, yep, I think I want to belong to that local congregation. So we're going to invite them to stand as we read their names, and then we're going to pray for them, blessing them, and welcoming them officially to Ephrata Community Church. You should have gotten a welcome booklet in your worship guide. I'm going to invite you. It's full of names and pictures and information about those 30 people. I'm going to invite you to read that as Wes is preaching later. <clears throat> I'm sorry. What I, what I meant was don't read it while Wes is pre uh, preaching later. Read it at another time. Sorry, Wes. Make sure I'm on the right page. We're going to welcome these 30 people. Um, Sharon Albright. Abby Beatty, Matt and Ariana Bolin, Scott and Lisa Byram, Steve and Krista Esch, Wes and Audrey Hoover, Lois Klein, Blake Martin, Lloyd and Miriam Miller, Sean and Beryl Rainick, Brady Stoner, Mark and Bethany Tomasetti, Isabella Tomasetti, Matt and Lindsay Terman, Nick Van Loor, Kevin and Jenny Weaver, Nesta Weaver, Abby Westra, Jordan and Miranda Zook, and Lewis and Doris Zook. Effort Community Church, your new members. <laughs> Should we tell them what they're in for? I was going to say, should we tell them what they've won, Bob? Uh, and I was like, that's, I'm in the wrong place. Um, hey, if you're, if you're near those uh, who are standing, please just extend your hands. We want to pray for them and bless them in Jesus' name. Church, would you join with me in prayer? Father, we thank you um, for the local church and the blessing uh, that it is. God, and we freely welcome uh, each one of these new members who've walked through the process of discernment and said, yep, I believe the Lord's calling me to effort a community church for this season of my life. And they fully stepped into that. God, we receive them in Jesus' name. I want to pray from 1 Peter 2 that says in verse 4, as you come to him, the living stone, who is Jesus, rejected by humans but chosen by God and precious to him, you also, like living stones, are being built into, spiritual into a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. And then a little later in verse 9, it says, You are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you as foreigners and exiles to abstain from sinful desires which wage war against your soul. 
live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of wrongdoing, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. Father, I thank you that you are knitting us together as the body of Christ. God, that there is a collective testimony that comes out of this congregation, that you are the God who has called us out of darkness and into great light. God, we look with eager expectation for the day of your visitation. God, we ask for more of your presence, God, in the life of the church, through the life of the church, as we gather and as we scatter. God, we thank you for those 30 people that are joining Effort of Community Church. God, we welcome them and their gifts. God, the things that you have skilled them with, their experiences, God, we welcome them, we receive them, and we bless them in Jesus' name to thrive and prosper all for the glory and for a testimony that the world might know that you are the God who saves. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Make sure if you see any of those new members over the course of the next couple months that you ask them, uh, welcome them, greet them. Um, take a look at some of those little details because there's some pretty interesting facts. Some of you have done some pretty amazing things. Um, hey, I, I know this might sound a little disingenuous, but I don't mean it to, to, to sound that way because the testimony you are about to hear is incredible. Um, pr- I can't even pick favorites, but just incredible because we look back uh, as pastors and leaders and say like, man, we've been asking God for things and then we continue to see God more and more we see God at work. And this testimony that you're about to see, Roy's testimony, is one of the things that we have been praying for for years. And we believe we're beginning to see uh, a new level of what God wants to do in this community and beyond. So turn your attention to the screen behind me for Roy's testimony. And then Pastor Wes is going to be up front sharing the message this weekend. I was in utility construction since I was 17 years old. Uh, heavy utility construction. I've had many broken bones. I was an avid weightlifter, heavy weightlifter, and I ended up blowing my back out. And I ruined myself when I did that. I ended up so much on pain medication, I was doing 300 Percocet a month, 10 milligrams Percocet a month. That wasn't working. They put me on fentanyl. It's It's bad. It's some bad stuff. I was on fentanyl for probably 20 years. It wasn't fair for my wife and my family. They didn't really know that much about it. I was a working addict. It was bad, really bad. I hated it. I started coming to the church and everything, and I said, man, I got to beat this. Everybody goes up front after church and and gets prayed upon and all that, and uh, I met Barry. He put his hand on me and prayed for me. I didn't tell him what my problem was. I was just telling him I needed help bad, real bad. Something came into my heart that I just felt totally different. And I walked out of church that day and I said, I can do this. I know I can do this. Because I got Jesus Christ on my side. It was tough, it really was. But with my family and the church, I just was determined to do this. And with God's help, I did it. Long story short, I've been clean for three years. I feel so much better. It's like a thousand pounds off your shoulders. He is the man. Yep, no doubt about it. No doubt. I mean, I've been through a lot my whole life, man, and my life has totally changed. Totally changed. (laughs) Oh, I just love seeing answers to prayer. As Chris said, something we've been praying for, just authority and belief for people to be free from addictions. And what a great testimony. 20 years of addiction uh, on withdrawal. Uh, You know, I love what he said in his testimony. Everybody after the service comes front for prayer. Did you catch that? (laughs) Because encounters with the Lord change things. And he left that day cold turkey off of painkillers and has been clean and free for three years. Hallelujah. Woo! Love it, love it, love it, love it. (laughs) Friends, we serve a custom-making God, right? Not only has he made each one of us, knows the amount of hairs on our head, 
but he customly makes divine encounters and appointments to meet us because he loves us that much. Well, good morning to all of you. Good to look around the room and see you. Welcome to those of you watching online. Great to have you joining us today as well. And if you're visiting with us today or maybe just tuning in for the first time, we began this year, launched into it, focusing on the attributes of God. It's a series that we've entitled God Is, and then we're leaving blanks, if you will, to to fill in different attributes of God. And I love how the Holy Spirit has led Kevin uh, in this series to have several of us on the pastoral team just share an attribute of God that has personally impacted us and in many cases shaped us. If I was to ask you today, hey, what's an attribute of God that you appreciate one that stands out to you, I'm guessing the one that would come to your mind or the two that would come to your mind are probably not coming to your mind because one day you were sitting by the pool or sitting in your favorite chair at your home and you just had this revelation that God is filling the attribute. Instead, I'm surely convinced um, you would tell me a story about a difficulty, a struggle, a disappointment, a hardship, something that you went through. And as you went through that experience, God showed up in that situation, and from that difficulty, you got and received a personal revelation, a a touch from God, and you've understood an attribute of God that no one can ever dispute you on because you know that you know that you know that God is. And while I would have a few attributes that I could share on, one of them that I know, that I know, that I know that our God is, is he is my and your healer. Now, there are numerous stories that I could relate around healing. Most of them I would probably put in the category of physical healing. But the area that I want to touch on, the area of focus, the category of healing I want to look at today actually occurred in a place that you cannot see because the the, the healing was emotional, emotional healing. The healing of a broken heart, a broken spirit, a challenging season in my life when I may have looked good on the outside, although that's debatable still today, (laughs) but I was falling apart and I was in pieces on the inside. Likely many of you will relate to at least some pieces of my story, although the circumstances are gonna be very different for you than they were for me. However, the emotional part of being wounded or disappointed and broken on the inside, those emotions, those feelings, those thoughts are similar. Emotional pain is hard. And emotional pain also tests what we believe about God. It tests our faith. Because when you go through a storm in life, a difficulty in life, you can't go through one without having your beliefs challenged, at least to some level. Some of you here today are healed, like me on the other side of that brokenness and now helping others, encouraging them in the healing and walking with them. Others of you today may be right in the middle of some thick smoke, confused, disappointed, painfully wounded, wondering where God is, perhaps even stuck. Now the Bible has a lot to say about wounds and the wounded as well. And the Bible has lots of stories and truths about God being our healer, our healer of mind, body, soul, and spirit. He is the Lord God, our healer. And I want to anchor today's message in the, this identity 
of who God is, our healer. And the first time God reveals this part of his identity is in Exodus chapter 15. We won't have time to read that story, but in Exodus 15, the Israelites just came through their Red Sea experience. And so their backs were to the wall. God divided the water. You know that miracle that God created. They walk through, right? And, and the waters close in over the Egyptian, Egyptians that were pursuing them, right? They all drown. And in chapter 15, it, uh, they break into a song. And they sing, the horse and rider has fallen to the sea. And they're just singing. They're rejoicing on the other side of the Red Sea experience. And near the end of the chapter, it says there are now three days. Three days of walking, walking, walking into the wilderness, into the desert. It was their 40-year desert tour, as I refer to it as. And they needed another miracle because they couldn't find water. There were three days into the desert, and the water that they had was running out, and they were looking for a place to drink. And they found a wadi, a place called Myra, a place that ended up tasting bitter. The water was bitter. And what's interesting is God, again, does a miracle with water. He did a miracle by opening the Red Sea, and now he does another miracle by making that water sweet so that they could drink it. But right before he does this miracle, God speaks to them. He makes a decree. A decree is really like an announcement, right? And he wanted the Israelites to know this announcement. And before he made this announcement about who his identity was, he, he said, listen, I want you to follow me he makes this plea. I want you to, to walk in my ways. I want you to believe in me. I want you to know that you can trust me. Why? Because as he says in verse 26, for I am the Lord, your healer. See, God knew they were going to go through some stuff. God knew they were going to go through some desert-like experience. God knew they were going to have division and pain and disappointment and brokenness, and some of them would experience trauma. It was going to be part of their life experience, as it is for some of us as well. And he wanted them to know that in the midst of their difficulty, in the midst of the diseases and challenges they would face, they could count on him as God, their healer. In fact, I love how the scripture uses and capitalizes the word Lord. In fact, whenever you encounter that in the Bible, Lord, capitalized, it indicates God's personal name. Isn't that cool? God interacts with us in a personal way. He's a personal physician. He's our healer. Now, it's one thing to read about God, our healer, whole different thing to experience and know this truth after walking through or going through some difficulty or some painful stuff in our life and for ourselves even encountering then this healing power of God and know that we know that he is our healer. It's not just head knowledge. God wants it to be heart knowledge. Now there's numerous things in life that can cause us pain. Usually they're tied to relationships because God's designed us for relationships, and that's usually where the greatest wounding come from. But what got me to that place of brokenness, a, a shattered heart, was actually something that happened in church, church pain. Have you ever been hurt by the church, wounded by followers of Jesus? Over a decade ago, I was in my 13th year of full-time pastoral ministry. I was leading an amazing church, a wonderful church. And I had so much uh, vision for it. We were growing and I was excited for what God was doing and believing that the Spirit was just lifting more lids and had more to give, more for us, more to experience. And in the midst of that, I made a judgment call, a leadership decision that wasn't received well by many in the congregation. It was misunderstood, perhaps, and all hurt broke loose. Things unraveled 
very quickly. Both private and public verbal shots were fired fast and furious. Many of them just pierced my heart. And I wasn't prepared for the massiveness of the storm, nor was I prepared for an experience that would cost me my ministry. Most of the time, I just felt like I just wanted to defend myself and couldn't. And thus, I felt isolated and judged, times misunderstood, attacked, betrayed by the people I loved and cared for and pastored. Furthermore, the people I trusted the most evacuated, and it crushed me. And to add to the pain was the awful reality that I was powerless to protect my wife and three children from the secondhand smoke. There's no self or there's no safe level of exposure to secondhand smoke. In the end, I lost my job. I was unemployed for seven months. I lost my calling. Part of my identity, I lost friends, and I lost community. I also lost hope in the local church. After all, where does a Christian pastor go for healing? What I didn't lose was my faith and my family. And I don't think I lost those two because I had spent years prior anchoring my faith in Jesus. Oh, sure, it was tested. Oh, believe me. But it remained intact because I was anchored, as Kevin said last week, to the rock. The other thing that stayed intact was my family. I'd spent years investing in my marriage, my relationship with my wife, and my relationship with my kids. And that stayed when everything else seemed to be shattered. My faith and my family was intact. And when I left that pastoral position, I was broken, I was beat up. But friends, I want you to know that I encountered the Lord, God, my healer. But it was a process, it was a journey, and I'll share more about that here in a moment. But the gospel of Jesus Christ is good news to broken hearts. Jesus died for all sinners, all of which we are, but he also died for soundness of mind. He died for the brokenhearted. He died for those who experienced, like me, a very deep, deep wounding in places that no one can see. Emotional healing isn't something we often talk about publicly, at least not too often, but I just want to reinforce today that God is the healer of the brokenhearted. He healed me. He put me back together, and he made me stronger. And I want to share with you some things that I learned during that three years of healing, a struggle with brokenness. And while these learnings were new to me, Others in the scripture had already experienced this and learned this and encountered this and encountered the Lord God, their healer. But before I share those learnings, I just want to anchor some of the thoughts in the gospel of Mark. Mark chapter 5, actually, where we see Jesus healing power in action, both physical healing and emotional healing healing. And it takes about five minutes to read Mark chapter 5. We don't have time to do that this morning. I just encourage you to do that later. But there's three stories in there. I'm going to just summarize briefly. Some of them may be familiar to you. And if not, you're newer to the church. They're they're just great stories that we see God showing up and, and healing. But there's some things that these individuals did that I think was key to their healing. The first story in Mark 5 is of a tormented man spiritually oppressed, demonically possessed. And maybe you've heard of his story because it's the one where Jesus identified the demon within him being legions, many, and sent him into the pigs. A number of years ago, I walked up that cliff up to this little precipice area where this town would have been where Jesus would have encountered this demoniac. And so as Jesus, I can just see him getting out of this boat there to see a Galilee and making his way up the side of that mountain. And as he's making his way up, 
this man, this violent and foul and awful man runs towards Jesus. And as you go back and read this story, it is so interesting to me that he doesn't run at Jesus. He runs to Jesus. Very interesting because I've done some deliverance ministry in my life and I, every demon I've encountered wants to run from him. So there was something apparently in a moment that the spirit The inner man within him was looking for something, looking for freedom, and he ran to Jesus. He falls on his knees, the scripture says, at Jesus' feet. Jesus identifies the demon, casts it out. This man is free, and he's delivered. He's healed. All the fragmentation, all the stuff going on in his mind, all that stuff just healed. Torment, suffering, brokenness, all that gone by the way, friends, that's not your destiny. Brokenness isn't your destiny. Pain isn't your destiny. Jesus is. Healing is. And despite the turmoil, this guy, in a moment, pushed through all of that stuff to pursue Jesus. And he encountered his healer. I don't know the rest of his story. Looking forward to hearing it someday in heaven. But the second story then in Mark chapter 5 is one of Jairus, and he has a 12-year-old daughter who is sick, deathly sick, actually. Jairus' job is security at the local synagogue, kind of like our constable. And he was in desperate need because some disease or some illness, not told what it is in Scripture, but had his daughter at death's door. And he comes to Jesus, and Jesus seems to hear his plea, and yet Jesus gets sidetracked by a woman with an issue of blood who just touched him, and Jesus just felt some healing power just leave his body. And so in the midst of that, Jerry's story just kind of goes in a timeout, a little bit on a pause, and he gets pushed to the edge, and he can't seem to get Jesus' immediate attention because Jesus is distracted, or Jesus just noticed healing power go out of him for someone else. Have you ever felt like Jarius? Just couldn't quite get Jesus' immediate attention. Felt like you were pushed to the side. Not noticed, maybe. So that story goes on pause, and then the scripture picks up the story of this woman. Twelve years of bleeding, and she too um, didn't want to be noticed. Why? because she was jumping over hurdles all of her life. I mean, think about all the hurdles. She went over, she had physical hurdles to overcome. I can imagine just lack of energy coupled with suffering and pain. And she had spiritual hurdles. I mean, in that day, the religious laws excluded her from participating in any kind of church life. And then she had social and emotional hurdles. She knew rejection. She understood loneliness. She felt it every day, isolation and feeling unworthy. And then, on top of that, she had financial hurdles. She spent everything she could, found every doctor, every medicine, every town, every community, every new thing to try to get her healing. But when Jesus was in town that day, she decided to push through all of that and to pursue Jesus And in her desperation, she pushes through the crowd, or I don't know, maybe she crawled through the crowd. And she reached as far as she could, doing her part, to touch the one who would do his part. And Jesus healed her. An amazing, an amazing story. I, too, look forward to meeting her in heaven and talking and hearing the rest of her story because we don't know the rest of her story in Scripture but she was transformed and healed. Well, chapter five of Mark ends with Jairus. It goes back to that story because as all this that I just told you was taking place with this woman and her issue with blood, word from home comes to Jairus. Hey, Jairus, your your daughter, she's dead. Just like, let's go home, sorry, right? And Jairus is like, no, no, I'm gonna not accept death as the final word. And so he goes back again to Jesus, and Jesus says, listen, I'll go with you. And Jesus goes back to his house. The daughter's dead by now, the scripture says. Jesus goes into the room with the family, raises the daughter to life, 
Jesus raised her back, gave her to the family. Again, another story I'm looking forward to hearing in heaven as well. A healing testimony of those that encountered Jesus. Friends, I want you to know and experience this God, this healer, this healer of brokenness, whether mind, body, or spirit. Man may specialize in crucifixions, but our God specializes in resurrections. Resurrections of spirit, resurrection of mind and heart. He did it for me because I was dying inside for a couple of years. I didn't like it. I didn't want to be that way. But it hurt. It disoriented me. I fought bitterness and depression and my heart was sick. But God met me and God healed me and God raised me back up. And I know that if he did it for me, he can do it for you. Because I encountered the Lord, your, my, our healer. I invite you just to pull out your message notes because there's five things I just want to share with you. Things that I learned. Others obviously learned these way ahead of me. But things that I learned in my own journey of healing. And while I'm focusing on emotional healing, these things obviously I think could apply to physical healing as well. But the first thing I just want to share is this, and that is that healing is a journey. It's a journey. It's not a destination. It's a journey. It's a process. And I admit to you that the journey is not always fun. And too often it lasts a lot longer than we want. But healing was a journey for all three individuals in Mark chapter 5. What they were dealing with in Mark 5, that wasn't just a bad day or a bad week. They were having a hard life, a long desert-like experience. And I wish healing was always instantaneous. In other words, as soon as we got a cut, instantly it's healed. As soon as we're wounded in our heart, instantly they're healed. I wish it was instantaneous, but it's not. Jesus is a divine healer, obviously. He can heal instantly, but usually that process is a journey. Healing is a journey. And the choices we make in the journey matter. They matter. And they're actually critical. We can have a choice to choose to journey with God, or we can have a choice to, ch to journey without God. They will take you to very different places. In the middle of my pain and heartache, I admit that trusting God and submitting to the Lord in the journey was harder than it was when things were going well. I wanted to fight or defend. I wanted to flee, right? Just run away. I wanted to freeze, hide. Not out of shame, but out of pain. Yet God kept inviting me into faith, faith, to trust him in a journey that didn't make sense. I would also testify to just the sovereign, the sovereign grace of God in that season. As I look back, I, I think I was unaware of how amazing God's grace was in that season, leading me in this wholeness and part of that journey. But I want you to know that her, uh, healing is a journey. Secondly, in your notes, I want to encourage you to process your pain with an inner circle of believers. When you're hurting, you know, the most common temptation is to project your pain on someone else. In my experience, I learned that processing pain was better than projecting pain. Emotional wounds don't self-heal. If not processed, they lie in dormant, they stay hidden, they stay buried, and then at an unsuspected time, perhaps an unsuspected way, they're going to leak out. It's why hurting people often hurt people. And in a period of time between leaving that congregation and Kevin inviting me to be a part of the pastoral team here, I had to recover from some stuff. Not just me, actually. My wife had to recover from some stuff, and so did my kids. And so my wife and I got some counseling 
reached out for help. But then we also created an inner circle around us. And that inner circle, in our case, was six individuals. Nothing special about the number, but six. So a couple that was our pastoral friends. They were pastors to us, an older couple that we loved and deeply loved us. We got another couple that was our, some of our best friends. And then we got my mentor and my wife's mentor. They didn't know each other, but they knew Jesus and they knew us. And we invited them into our living room and we said, would you sit with us for a season? Help us process our pain. Do you know that Jesus had an inner circle too? When he was in Gethsemane, right? Crying out, sweat, drops of blood, the scripture says there were three that were with him. Jesus had an inner circle as he cried out to the Father. Is there not another way? Inner circle of believers is really helpful. That group helped me heal. They helped confirm what I was hearing from God since I wasn't even sure that I was hearing from God correctly. And that group saved my life. And they helped to save my calling. And some of you today are not okay. And you need to know that it's okay not to be okay. Something happened to you. And it's okay not to be okay. It's just not okay to walk through painful experiences by yourself. And it's not okay to think there are no solutions. And it's not okay to blame yourself for everything that happened. The deeper you embrace honesty with an inner circle, the deeper the freedom and healing. And I also would be an advocate for an inner circle of believers. Psalms chapter 1, verse 1 says, Blessed is the person that does not sit in the seat of sinners or in the counsel of the wicked. Right? So the opposite of that, what, what the scripture is saying is, Blessed is the person that sits in the counsel of believers. Process your pain with an inner circle of believers. It is part of the healing journey. It takes vulnerability but it's worth it. Third, pursue God for your healing. The three in Mark chapter five, all three of them, they were pursuing God. They pursued Jesus and they pursued his presence. Just like the end of last year, we, were, we continued to pursue the Lord for his presence, a heavy presence of the Lord. And we're praying for more of that, more of his presence, right? Because as you encounter the Lord and you encounter his presence, things change. Actually, you change. I changed. It may not mend all the circumstances, but God does a change in you. There are lots of obstacles often in the way from healing. It's difficult in the journey because our emotions are often raw. It's interesting, the same year uh, that I was processing most of the deepness of my pain, uh, Rick Warren, who wrote The Purpose Driven Life, some of you have read, may be familiar with that. Rick is the founding pastor of the Saddleback Church in California. And uh, he experienced, the same year that I was walking through some stuff, he experienced um, his own son's struggle with mental health. He had a 27-year-old son that committed suicide. And I don't know Rick, and I've never met Rick, but I watched from afar that year as he talked openly about that experience. And on one particular time, he shared something that resonated with me. Uh, it gave words to my painful experience. It helped me process it in a healthy way. And he, he shared a list of six words, and I'll put them on a slide for you. And they're these, kind of in a process, shock of what just took place. Sorrow, level of grief, struggle, and pain, difficulty, surrender, sanctification, which is just a big church word for God purifying us, clean hands, pure heart, and then service, helping others because you're now healed. 
And when I saw that list, it really helped me in my process. It helped me to know where I am in that journey. But I also have come to believe that I'm not sure you can really get past struggle without Jesus, the one who heals. Because once you surrender and give it to Jesus, something shifts, something changes. Jesus died for all of our sins, and he died for all our diseases. Anything that causes you and I dis-ease. Healing is based on the atonement, the blood of Jesus Christ. Christianity, by the way, is the only religion whose God has wounds. By his stripes, we are healed, the scripture says. So pursue him. And the healing process might take a couple of years like it did for me or like for the characters in Mark chapter 5, but there is breakthrough, there is learning, there is growth, there is new life helping others on the side of surrender. By the way, surrender does not mean giving up. Surrender means giving over. It's very different. <laughs> I remember I was driving one day in that season, just, and I was crying. I was kind of mad at God. And I said to the Lord, God, I give up. And it was in that moment the Holy Spirit quickened that word to me, Wes, surrender is not giving up. It's giving it over. And that was so helpful, an encounter with the Lord that helped me. Fourth, God doesn't waste pain. He redeems it. I just finished reading Job this week, the book of Job, and I'm just so impressed by that guy's story. And, and in chapter 19, I think it's verse 25, Job says, I know. I'm like, this guy's in the middle of it. Like, it's not all back together for him. He's in the middle of it. He's not, and his friends aren't being very helpful. And, and by the way, I pray, Lord, don't let me be like Job's friends to somebody. <laughs> I want to be a healer, not a finger pointer. But anyway, in the middle of that, in chapter 19, verse 25, I think it is, like I said, uh, Job says, I know, I know that my Redeemer lives. It wasn't all back together, but God doesn't waste pain. And interestingly enough, a large part of my own healing came from the very place that I was hurt, the church. I was hurt in one church setting, and I found healing in another church setting. I was hurt by believers, and I was healed by believers. God can redeem your past and your pain using you to bring freedom and wholeness and support to others. Around here we call it make a difference. All of us are called and have something to give to extend the kingdom, the ever-extending and expanding kingdom of God. Yet one of the keys in the redemption process is forgiveness. Forgiveness really is the healing antidote to woundedness. It works. It's not hard. It, it's hard, and it takes work, but forgiveness matters. We may feel justified to even the score, to fight for our right, but forgiveness is what God invites us to do, and forgiveness begins with a decision, not a feeling. And as we forgive, and forgive again, and forgive again, bitterness cannot take root in forgiveness. And I took an intentional road, path toward forgiveness. And by intentional, I mean I asked my wife and that group of six to hold me accountable, to ask me questions, to help me walk in that healing process. And I learned the power of forgiveness actually opened up for me deeper levels of grace and deeper levels of healing. Because, friends, there's beauty that can come out of ashes, beauty out of brokenness. God doesn't waste pain. He redeems it. Now, one final thought I want to give to you that probably borderlines being a little challenging, but it's truth for the journey. 
and something I want to encourage you in, and that is this, that your pain may not be your fault, but pursuing God for healing is your responsibility. It's not someone else's. It's yours. Because we've all experienced wounds, some of them superficial, water off our back, and others deep. And maybe the arrows are still sticking And I know there's probably a lot of heartbreak here in the room and even some of you watching online today. But you can't take any medication that's gonna keep you from life's pains and disappointments. But please hear me. There is more of Jesus' healing power for your heart and your life than you really know. He is a God That's a healer. After all, it's part of his name. For I am the Lord, your personal healer. I was crushed. but I survived. I cried a lot, but I survived. Yeah, I didn't always manage my emotions well, but I survived. And I went through some stuff and I went through a test only to experience and encounter a healing and redemptive power of Jesus that took all the pieces that were apart inside me and put them back together again. And I encountered the Lord, my healer. Now there may have been some stuff that was done to you was not your fault. Or maybe people think it was your fault. Or maybe some of what you've experienced was in part your fault. Your pain, though, your healing is your responsibility to pursue the Lord in the midst of it. I know there's a lot of loss and a lot of pain but I want you to know that's not your destiny. Here at ECC, we want you to encounter the Lord God, your healer. We pray for that, physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually. You can and will thrive again. It will look different. It'll feel different. You know why? Because you are different. I'm different. Not quite the same. I've learned some stuff about me, I've learned some stuff about God, and I've learned some stuff about people. Ultimately, your pain is either going to be a jail that imprisons you or a school that empowers you. Pain is probably the greatest teacher in my life, and encountering the healing touch of Jesus made me stronger and restored me to the place of loving his church again (laughs) more than I ever did before. While it was one of the hardest seasons in my life, it also ended up being one of the most formational. And as I was walking through that series, that journey in my life, I was keeping a journal, keeping a record of feelings and scriptures, but there were a couple of verses that as I went back and looked through my journal that I began to collect and a handful of them that I began to write out on a page that I'd often go back to. And I just want to share these scriptures with you as part of the word of God washing your soul today. Because some of you may need a spiritual shower. And I want to pray for that here in a moment. But before I do, these scriptures... Psalms 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. Psalms 103, 4. He redeems my life from the pit and crowns me with love and compassion. Psalms 107, 20. He sent his word and healed our diseases. And I'll add anything that causes you and I dis-ease. 
Isaiah 43, 3, a bruised reed he will not break and a smoldering wick he will not stuff out. It was a promise to hold on to. Matthew 11, verse 28, Jesus says, come, come to me. All you who are weary and burdened, and I'll add broken to that burden. And Jesus said, I will give you rest. In 2 Corinthians 12, 19, my grace is sufficient for you. For my power is made perfect in weakness. I would just invite you to stand. I want to pray for you this morning. I'm going to ask you to stand and to close your eyes, actually. And I'm asking you to close your eyes if just as a way of honoring every person's space just between you and God just for a few moments. Because I want to pray over those of you here today that may just not be feeling okay, broken inside. And I'm not going to ask you to identify yourself. Don't worry. I'm not calling you out. That's why I have everyone standing and everyone closing their eyes. Only you know the depth of your need. Only you know where you are in the journey. And only you know how broken those pieces might feel inside. But I want for you what I believe God wants for you. And that is a journey of healing, a healing touch, an encounter with the one who heals. So Lord Jesus, today I just take a few moments and I just pray and speak the name of Jesus over every heart listening online or here today that is not okay on the inside. And I ask you, Holy Spirit, that you would come and mend and take and hold and begin, God, to arrange those pieces of healing and bringing things back together again. Because that's who you are. And that's what you do. Lord, I pray for those here today that are still really hurt from stuff done to them. Stuff may be out of their control struggling to forgive, struggling to know where to, what to do even next. God, I pray for your strength and your touch upon their spirit today. I pray, God, as so much emotional pain comes out of broken relationships, I submit to you, God, all of those broken relationships. And today, I also want to pray for those that have been hurt by the church, maybe hurt by a pastor, hurt by some believers, hurt in leading, and maybe have not found complete healing. And I just pray, Lord, just for your comfort, for just a kind of a spiritual shower of the blood of Jesus, just to begin washing over them from the top of their head to the bottom of their feet, healing emotions and pain and brokenness. And I pray for them today, Lord. And Lord, I also want to pray for those that have been wounded by the church and are no longer part of the church today, maybe de-churched, unchurched. And Lord, I'm calling them because you're calling them back to yourself. And I pray for many in this room that even have family members that have been wounded maybe by the church and they're not walking with you. And God, we, are, we just believe by faith that you are God that heals and we just invite and declare your name upon every one of those hearts because you're calling them by name. You're inviting them to come to you, to surrender, to get place past that place of hurt. God, I thank you that you heal lives. I thank you that hope is found in you. And Jesus, I thank you that you can change everything and anything. I pray that you would walk into our heart right now and mend the brokenness and heal the hurt and provide hope for today and faith for tomorrow. As 
I speak again the name of Jesus over your soul. The Lord God, your to say, I am trusting and placing my faith in the Lord and who he is in the sinfulness of my own nature. I can see that, but I see who God is, is and I see it's not supposed to be that way. I can look at the life of Jesus that was lived perfectly and then sacrificed on behalf of me and my situation in a world full of brokenness. And I can say yes to following after him and respond to that invitation. If you've never taken that step, man, we wanna pray with you uh, before you leave this place. Please reach out to us. Uh, the prayer teams are here. There are other ways you can reach out if you're watching uh, online. You can call, you can email, you can actually text know him to 97,000. We wanna connect with you. That's the first step. You know, I think probably everyone in this room at watching online as well could probably respond to that word on emotional healing. 
especially being church, uh, hurt uh, in church. And yet we know that God created us to be in relationship. Uh, so I would invite you to not shrink back from actually sharing that with someone else. The prayer team is here if you want to share with someone and have them pray for you. We would love to do that. One of the things that was heavy on my heart as the service was coming to a close was just a recognition. I think the Lord was speaking to me that there are many people who hear this message and they look in Internal, into their own life, into the broken situation or some emotional uh, healing that's still needed. And they say something along the lines that sound like this. I can't go back there. I know I'm not healed, but I can barely even function back there with what happened to me. So I'm just going to smooth it over and do my best to move forward in life. I've even tried to get healing and maybe you're in the room here, you're listening to me and you're saying, I've tried to get healing, but I've, I'm just, I'm so crushed. Or even someone tried to help me, but even in the act of helping me in, in church, in a place I felt like I was safe, man, it just, it was like a sledgehammer. It didn't work. Can I say to you that the Holy Spirit is a master healer. Man, God can put his finger right on the issue, right in the midst of everything else that is life right now. The Holy Spirit can put his finger right on the issue and beginning begin to minister healing. So can I encourage you after hearing a message on God is our healer and even emotional healing with testimonies, can I encourage you not to leave this place without responding to the Lord Yes, Lord. Yes, you are my healer. And if the Lord opens doors for you to share with other people, that's great. But can we just begin with a corporate, yes, Lord, you are my healer in every area of life. So our prayer teams are here and do not leave this place. He is the God who is our healer. If you're visiting, I'm just going to remind you of the first steps. It's now open. Pastor Dan is there. He'd love to say hi. I want to read this passage that read, or I'm sorry, that Wes read over us um, as the service was coming to a close here. From Matthew 11, Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. For I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. I bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Show us your glory. Show us your glory.